All right, so we are in Matthew chapter 11. We want to do something I haven't done before. I want to give a shout out to someone today <laughs> that might be watching. And that is D'Angelo in Georgia and Preacher in the Box. Is that YouTube, Preacher in the Box? So that's D'Angelo in Georgia. Amen. And uh, that'll probably freak him out. But his buddy Todd told me to, to do that. So amen, D'Angelo. All right. Today is Labor Day, right? Which is, well, actually it's Labor Day weekend. It's actually tomorrow is Labor Day. A holiday where we remember people who labor by not going to labor, right? We rest, supposedly. I don't know. I've never figured out how that works. It's the day we remember working by not working. I don't understand that. But what a great time to do this chapter, chapter 11 of the book of Matthew, because verse 28, 29, and 30 is all about coming unto Jesus, ye that labor. <laughs> and are heavy laden. Uh, yeah, I planned that. I planned that just perfectly, didn't I? No. A lot of churches, they plan the holidays to their messages, but this just happened to work out this week. So praise the Lord for that. That's kind of cool. Well, our outline here for Matthew chapter 11 is verses 1 through 19. It's all about John. Remember John the Baptist? Verse 20 to 24, Jesus says, woe to certain cities. Now, when God says, woe, you better watch out, right? Because that means something bad is coming. Um, verse 25 to 27, Jesus prays. We see Jesus praying. And then verse 28 through 30 is come to Jesus for rest. And this kind of has a double application. Rest to us who are saved, we rest in Christ, but rest, the millennial rest. So you see that double application. Ray put this in my head, the idea to draw this out to you. What we've been seeing is Jesus in his earthly ministry, and he's talking to the people there during that time. He's also talking about the tribulation, what they're going to go through, and telling them about the kingdom, right? But spiritually, we can apply some of what Jesus says to us today. So that's why we read the book of Matthew, to see what we can spiritually apply to us. And there's a lot, but the majority of it is Jesus speaking to the Jews, okay? And we remember that. So we'll start here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. And Matthew 11, 1 says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. So we remember this last time, I hope. I hope you all remember last time where we talked about when Jesus sent out his disciples. So that means all twelve of his main disciples went out and he was alone. Now, was he alone? Well, he, he usually traveled with people, and people, wherever he went, usually flocked to him. So he wasn't really alone. But he was not with his 12 disciples. And we'll turn back to chapter 10 and look at that. Chapter 10, and I believe it's verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, the Samaritans were up north of Israel. So from what we're going to see today, Jesus sent the disciples to go south and Jesus continued on up north. So he kind of split them, if you will, north and south. <laughs> and the disciples went south and did their thing. Then they came back. But while they were doing their thing, Jesus was up here doing something. And we're going to see how that worked out this week. So Jesus here goes out alone. Well, that's what it kind of sounds like. Or perhaps he was with other disciples apart from the 12. But what we've already seen is him sending the 12 out. And I'm going to show you some references. When we go to the cross references, we're going to bring all this together. I don't know. I told you last week how long they were gone. It could have been a week. It could have been two weeks. It could have been, I don't know, a month or two. But however long it was, they did come back. And when they came back to Jesus, they were like, wow, guess what happened to us? They got to heal people and raise the dead. Do everything that Jesus was doing, they did. So is that amazing or what? And they were like, wow, even the devils are, are subject to us through your name. So they, they had fun in the physical world and the spiritual world. And wow, it just sounds like they had an amazing time. So you would think they would believe in Jesus and who Jesus is. You would think the people that got healed and all these other things would believe who, who Jesus was. But we still see doubt. And in this chapter, we're going to see some of the doubt is from a guy you think shouldn't be doubting, right? And we're going to see that here in a moment. So back to chapter 11. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. 
And when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Now this is John the Baptist, and he is in prison. Why is he in prison? Well, you know the story. Herod was there, and he told Herod, you're an adulterer. And Herod the politician got upset. How dare you? <laughs> and put him in jail. So he's in jail, and he hasn't died yet. But in jail, what happens? Well, there's a birthday, and uh, this young lady comes and dances before him, and she's the daughter of the guy that he's in the adulterous affair with or whatever. And he says, up to half of my kingdom, I'll give you. And she said, what should I ask? What should she asked her mother, and the mother was upset because she was kind of a Jezebel, if you will. How dare that man, that preacher, tell me I'm an adulterer? And she said, go tell him I want the head of John the Baptist in a charger. A charger is a big platter. Well, if he'd been a real man, he would have said, well, I set up to half of my kingdom and he's in the half you can't touch, right? That's what he should have said. But he went ahead and had them behead John the Baptist. Interesting. John the Baptist was beheaded. When is the time when they behead people? <laughs> Tribulation. That makes us think, oh, we way out there. But uh, that just came to me. That was kind of a blessing right there. Where would that come from? Amen. Thank you, Lord. So John the Baptist is in jail and he still has disciples. So there's still people following John the Baptist. You think they would have all gone and, and followed Jesus instead. But he's still got some faithful ones with him that are visiting him in jail. What a blessing that, that you're not forgotten when you serve the Lord. Amen. But he's in jail and then he starts to doubt. And what we're about to read is the doubting Baptist, John the Baptist. <laughs> he's doubting. <laughs> now, what is he doubting? I don't think he's doubting that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. But I think he's doubting, what did you come for, Jesus? Because the mindset of all the Jews is when the Messiah shows up, he's the king. He's going to kick Rome out and we're going to start our kingdom where the king is the king again like King David. So they were looking at the coming seed as a military leader who was going to lead them against the Romans and win. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus was all about, no, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> he was interested in the more spiritual thing and physically healing them and things like that. So it sounds like what he's doubting is the timing. It's like, why am I in jail and why are you not the king of Israel yet? That's what it sounds like. So let's continue reading here. Now, when Jesus had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, why would he say that? He knew that. He knew who Jesus was. He, he, that's a dumb thing to ask. He knew exactly who. But you see what he's doing? He's, he's kind of like, you know, Lord, I haven't heard anything. I'm sitting here in jail for a long time waiting on you. <laughs> you know, what? He's trying to get the Lord's attention is what it sounds like. And that's what it sounds like he's doing. Now, let's stop there and let's back up and look at this. Because... Deep down, I believe he knew Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, he already said that he was, but he's doubting and he's doubting because he's in jail and he's fully expecting to be in the kingdom by now, probably. So he's doubting a little bit. So he sends word through his disciples to ask Jesus that question. Art thou he that should come or do we look for another? Now, let's go to Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was, so I guess you could say this was being a little bit sarcastic on his part. You know, kind of like children are with their parents sometimes. <laughs> and they shouldn't be. But anyway, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. I indeed baptize with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now verse uh, 13 through 15. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbid him, forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And so he knew who he was baptizing. He knew who Jesus was. Flip over to the book of John. So do you see this? It's almost like he's doubting. But at the same time he knows, but... Do you ever, I don't know, sometimes doubt things when you shouldn't, you know better? Well, so he's just like doubting, you know, is this, I don't think he's doubting is Jesus the Messiah. I think he's doubting the timetable. Like, I thought you were supposed to be in the kingdom already ruling. I thought you would have kicked the Caesar out of Rome by now. I mean, that's what, that's my, as I read into it, what I'm thinking that he's doubting. John chapter 1 and verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? That was what the 
Pharisees asked Jesus. Now John's doing the same thing the Pharisees did. Uh Uh-oh, he's kind of going backwards in his relationship to the Lord, isn't he? In jail, instead of getting closer to God. And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Okay? And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. So they're, they're asking John the Baptist who he is. Well, that's what John the Baptist is doing. He's asking Jesus, Who are you? Are you the one? Or should we look for another? And now let's read... Um, well, let's read all the way down to verse 28. Um, and they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to him that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Okay, we're going to look at this here in a little bit later in this chapter of Matthew 11. So I, that's why I'm reading all this, because this all ties into Elijah or Elias. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now let's go ahead and read verse 29 to 31. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So, John knew very well who Jesus was. Didn't he? I mean, he announced this is him. Now go back to Matthew 11. Now we see John in jail, and he's questioning and in Matthew eleven three, 3, he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Wasn't that what the Pharisees asked? So it's almost like John the Baptist became a Pharisee a little bit. Well, not really, but he, he was just so in the dumps that he began to say the same things they did. You think he would have been closer to the Lord in jail. You know, sometimes suffering uh, makes us closer to the Lord. But he's having doubts, okay? We'll just, we'll just say it like that. He's having doubts. He's like... Are you, are you really the one? Because, because let's, just, let's just look at it like this. He's in jail feeling sorry for himself. Have you ever done that? You ever feel sorry for yourself? And then you're like, Lord, who are you even? i like, look at me and the way you're treating me, God. Have you ever been there in your life? No. And who are you? Maybe it shouldn't be who are you, Lord. Maybe it should be who am I? Because I deserve far worse than this, don't I? I deserve hell. And everything else is just the grace of God. Amen. Amen. So I, I want to feel sorry for John, but also I see my life. I, I'm like, dude, John, quit being a baby. Right. That's, that's how I want to feel. too. So I'm looking at this, but he's 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 in a pickle. All right. We'll just say it like that. So this chapter is about him. And in verse four, Jesus answered and said unto them, who's that? The disciples of John. So they're going to go back and tell John what Jesus is saying here. Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. He says, look at the signs. All right, Jews seek after a sign. John the Baptist was a Jew? Yeah. He wasn't a Baptist, (laughs) as we look at Baptists today. He was a Jew. And Jesus said, look at all these signs. Well, it's kind of hard for John the Baptist to see that if he's in jail, right? So he's just hearing things. He's not, he's not getting to see it with his, you know, Jews have to see it to believe it. So that's an interesting thing right there. He's kind of in jail. Unless there was a window in the jail, maybe he could look out and see people getting healed. But it didn't sound like he could see it. But look at verse 6. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. <laughs> so that's like a jab to John the Baptist. Hey, don't get offended. It sounds like John the Baptist was offended. I mean, I can put myself in his shoes. Can you? He's sitting there in the jail, probably crying his eyes out, praying, Lord, you know what I did for you? I gave up everything for you. And I lived in the wilderness and I ate bugs. And this is how you treat me? Look at me. I'm in jail. (laughs) Okay. So you want to feel bad for John the Baptist. And Jesus, I think, recognizes this and says this. But after they leave, Jesus continues and then he And then he praises John the Baptist. So Jesus loved John the Baptist and thinks that he was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. 
but we all have our bad days. That's what I want to say. <laughs> and so we do look up to John the Baptist. We think he's a great man, but he's having some bad days right here. Okay? So, blessed is, is whosoever shall not be offended in me. So that was kind of a right there to John the Baptist. Hey, <laughs> don't get offended. All right, so John, deep down, knew Jesus was the Messiah, but he had doubts. Now, he had some doubts because, number one, he's in jail. Number two, Jesus isn't on his throne yet. And number three, he's not getting any more ministry to do for the Lord, except an instant jail ministry, right? And maybe, that, maybe he got to, I don't know, lead people to Jesus in the jail in the sense that he's telling them that's the Messiah. But it, it sounds like he's just in the dumps. So what does the rest of it say? Well, verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. Okay, so they go back. So they go back. So they don't get to hear this, the disciples of John. I wish they had because this would have been good for John to hear too. But they just go back and give this message, don't be offended in me, while Jesus says this to the rest of the people there. Okay, so it doesn't sound like John gets much comfort <laughs> because he doesn't get to hear this part. But this part is in the Bible, and for 2,000 years people have been reading about how great of a man he was. So he's in the jail, down in the dumps, feeling horrible, and yet God has honored him for 2,000 years, saying he's the greatest prophet that ever lived. So our perspective isn't always the Lord's perspective, okay? And what you think about yourself isn't always what God thinks about you, right? All right, went a long way to, to kind of say that, but maybe someone needed to hear that. Amen? Look at yourself the way God does. You might think you're the worst and that everything's going wrong. God looks down from heaven and says, no, that's my son and he's a prince. <laughs> and he's going to rule with me one day. So just remember who you are in God's eyes, okay? Now, he says here, in verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Now, what is that, a reed shaken with the wind? It's going like this. It's, it's bending over this way. It, to me, it sounds like violent, like a hurricane wind. It's going like this. So that makes me think of John the Baptist and how he preached. He was probably a loud preacher who was probably like, you need to get saved. You're going to burn in hell. Keep the he, and that's probably what, and so that's what they were going out to hear is this crazy guy. You know, they probably thought, this crazy guy telling everybody they're going to hell. So it, it sounds like that's kind of like, I mean, that's the only way I understand what you went out to see, a reed shaking with the wind. And then it says, and what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Now, I wore this today. All right, $20 at a thrift store, okay? I think it's buffalo skin or something like that, but feel that. Is that soft? Mm -hmm. Look how thick that is. It's kind of hard, and it's kind of hard to unbutton. So it's, it's leather, basically. So do you remember that John the Baptist, he wore camel's hair and leathern garments? This is hot. I want to take it off because it's so hot. So I was just trying to figure out and try to identify with John the Baptist. Leather is cheap. You just go kill an animal, skin it, and put it on. What is soft clothing? Well, the rich people, the kings, had what's called soft clothing. A lot of times it came from silk. You know where silk comes from? Silk comes from a worm's butt. Oh, I probably could have said that less crudely. Uh, silk comes from a worm's rear end. And it takes a long time to get those little strands. And someone has to sit there and do this as that keeps coming out and then have to make things. So kings always get the nicest clothing, right? But poor people have to wear leather. And a lot of times it's sweaty. So John the Baptist probably was a sweaty, stinky man. And people looked at him like, all he does is yell at us, right? <laughs> and all he's trying to do is tell them the greatest news in the entire universe that God himself is here on earth visiting us. So it's interesting how the world looks at somebody and thinks they're nuts, and yet they look up to somebody who's usually not even saved and is a bad person. Who would have had soft clothing? Herod. And he was a murderer and an adulterer. Okay? So I just, I found that, I, I had to try to identify with John the Baptist today, wearing, wearing some leather here. I wish it was camel. That would have been cooler. By the way, I get my clothes at the thrift store. So, yeah, I'm not a rich guy. <laughs> anyway, so it says here, and... Uh, but what went ye out for to see? Verse 9, a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. 
So John the Baptist was a prophet. Now watch what he says in verse 11. He's not just a prophet, a specific prophet that was the one that was to announce Jesus' coming. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Wow, what a thing to say. He's literally saying of everyone that's ever been born on the earth, that's a human being, a man. There's nobody better than John the Baptist. Can you say anything better about anybody than that? Except for Jesus, but he's God in the flesh. So he was a great man. Now what made him great? I don't know. Maybe he was fully surrendered to the Lord. But he's not doing so good, is he? Even great men sometimes doubt and have problems and go through spells and things like that, that that it sounds like John the Baptist has gone through. But Jesus is really praising him. So he went from saying, don't be offended in me, and it sounds like he's putting him down, to praising him and saying, he's the best guy ever lived. Wow. (laughs) Could you imagine if your name was in the Bible? Would you like that? If there was a story in the Bible about you? And that story in the Bible about you was 2,000 years old. And that story in the Bible says you're the greatest person that ever lived. I'd be like, wow. So I bet John the Baptist is in heaven going, thank you for putting that in there, Lord. I didn't hear that at the time because the disciples didn't stick around to hear that one because that would have been encouraging. But thank you, Lord, for remembering what I did and my sacrifice for you. So basically, he's praising the guy. Now, it says, verse 11 again, Very I say unto you, among them that are born of women... There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the greatest guy that ever lived, there's still people better than him. I wonder who that would be. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Now, again, kingdom of heaven is the millennial kingdom. That's the physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is the spiritual kingdom. All right. There's quite a difference between the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God in the Bible. But it's talking about taking it by force. Now, there's a movie that Hollywood made called Kingdom of Heaven. Have you ever heard of it? And it's a movie about the Crusades and how they were over there. And they, But even they know that kingdom of heaven is the physical on the earth kingdom where people fight and try to take over a kingdom. So I thought that was interesting. But here it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, the violence and the violent take it by force. Who's in charge of the world today? The devil. He's called the God of this world, little g. And according to the Bible, he's going to take over for seven years, the Antichrist. And he's doing a good job of it, isn't he? I mean, he is forcing people to go along with his agenda. All right. I told you a little bit before we started here, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, Joseph and I went to the Blue Wahoo Stadium to watch a baseball game. And we walk up to the counter and it says, this is a cashless stadium. I said, how much are the tickets? She told me I pulled out $40 and I said, I want to come in. She said, we don't take cash anymore. I said, why not? It says right here, good for all debt, public and private. I said, the the government's no good anymore (laughs) that you can't take the promise right here that, that I can pay with this. She said, we don't do that. And you go inside, no one takes cash. It's a cashless stadium. And she said that all the sports stadiums are doing that. That's leading to the mark of the beast, isn't it? One of the greatest joys in this life is getting a paycheck, putting some money in your wallet, and going somewhere and buying something with cash. Cash is privacy because nobody knows what you bought. They've taken away your privacy. And what are they doing? Well, who prospers from all this? The credit card companies that get 3% on everything you buy with a credit card. So I see, and I hate to say it, but I see America is over. It's defunct. And this is all the CBDC. This is all, this is by force taking away and then saying, now you have to do what we say because this is leading to the mark of the beast, the cashless society. And it's here. It's starting to get here. So that, to me, that, that ruined me. I'm done with sports. I don't want to go see a ball game anymore. I don't want to give them my credit card information. Especially when you know that can be hacked and all that other. Why can't you use cash? It's just, it's bothersome. It's horrible. So that's the world we live in and they're taking it by force. And they're more and more forcing people to comply with their agenda. Mm -hmm. And where's it going to end up? Mark of the beast system. That's where it's going to end up. And we're seeing it. But anyway, verse 12 here says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violence take it by force. Well, who were the violent ones in that day? Rome. Who were the violent ones after that? 
the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> and you can look into the Spanish Inquisition for more about that. Now, verse 13 says this. It says, For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So the law and the prophets were till John. So here are the law and the prophets here. And a dispensation takes place, if you will, something new right here. And the law and the prophets, they're all up into this guy. And so God's starting to change a little bit into doing something different. And we see a little bit of change here with John the Baptist, and then it goes to Jesus. Well, we see the apostles, and then it changes to Paul's doctrine. So apostles, so we see that there's when a transition takes place, there's a time of transition. And so what was the ministry of John? Well, it was about six months. Now, I don't know how much longer he sat in jail, but uh, the Bible says the law and the prophets are until John. Does that mean we're still under the Old Testament law then? <laughs> not at all. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But we see there's a beginning of a change there. Now, here's the next thing, verse 14. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Now, whenever you see Elias, that is Elijah, okay? Because Elijah is from the Hebrew spelling. Greek is Elias. So when they translated, they translated from the Greek and they put Elias because it says Elias in Greek. When they put it in the Old Testament, they translated Elijah because it's Hebrew. But you should know who it's talking about. Okay? I don't believe that's some sort of error or anything like that. We know exactly who he's talking about. Elijah is Elias. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Now, what a thing to say. If you'll receive it, this is Elias. Remember I told you last week, this is how it ended up, because they rejected Jesus. Then there's 2,000 years of the church age. Then it goes back to dealing with Israel. So because they rejected their Messiah, well, then God said, okay, if you don't want me, I'll take the gospel to the Gentiles. This is how it could have been. If they had accepted Jesus, well, he probably would have died anyway still, because he came to do that anyway. But then there would have been the tribulation right here. And so there would have only been about seven years and then Jesus comes back, then the kingdom sets up right there. So this is how it could have been. And here is showing this again by the words, if you shall receive it. So if you will receive it. So God is giving them, just like I told you last week, the opportunity to accept him. And it could have been like this, but because they rejected, it's like this. This is how we know it today. Okay, now, how could John the Baptist have been Elijah? That's a good question. Uh, a lot of people, they have two main things that they like to ask about when they really get into the Bible and start studying it. And the first is, who are the 144,000? Mm -hmm. And then they say, who are the two witnesses? And then uh, another one that, that's common question is, how is John the Baptist Elijah? I remember when I went to Honduras for the first time, I was with Brother Perfecto Erraso, is his name. The only man I ever met that was perfect. Because his name is Perfecto, perfect. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting there and, and uh, he says, I'm a pastor. And he goes, but I just can't figure out how is John the Baptist Elijah? I said, ah, es un estudio bueno, vamos a estudiar. I said, great Bible study, let's do it. And I showed him in the Bible and he was like, oh, I've always wanted to know the answer to that. So I love to study about this and I love things like this in the Bible. So let's find out how he's looking at John the Baptist as Elijah. OK, because it is in the scriptures and we can see this if we look. So if you receive it, this is Elias. OK, well, first of all, why Elias? Why Elijah? Why is he saying Elijah? Well, right there in verse 10, it says, for this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which will prepare thy way before thee. So this is a prophecy uh, where Jesus is prophesying. And this is back in the book of Malachi. Let's go to Malachi. And the Bible is a very specific book. So it's very specific. And Malachi, let's look, look at Malachi. Should be the last book in the Bible. Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament. And that is found in Malachi 3.1. What we read in Matthew 11.10. Uh, so there's Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So 
He's coming to the temple. It sounds like the reason Jesus came was to start this right here. But they had the opportunity to accept it or reject it. They reject it, so it's postponed. Okay, we call that the postponement theory. But let's turn now over to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. And look what it says here in verse 5. Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Who is mentioned right before that in verse 4? Moses. That's why I believe and I teach that the two witnesses in the tribulation are Moses and Elijah. Because it just makes sense. And we saw that as we went through our verse by verse through the book of uh, Revelation. But the Old Testament prophecy is Elijah is going to come first. Right? Now, I told you how I went to a Jewish Passover feast one time in Detroit, Michigan. My big girlfriend at the time was invited and she said, can I bring my boyfriend? And they said, yeah. And I got to sit there and watch all the traditions that they do, the Jews, in their Passover feast. And one of the things they did is they poured a glass of wine and then the woman of the house got up and walked away. And I'm just asking questions. So I'm like, what's she doing? Oh, she's going to go put that on the front doorstep. So why is she putting a glass of wine on the front doorstep? What's that all about? They said, that's for Elijah. I go, Elijah's not coming back. <laughs> and they said, oh no, he is. I go, where's that in the Bible? Malachi. Oh, so it's right there. So even the Jews know to this day that Elijah has to come according to the prophecy of Mount. And they believe he's coming and they put a glass of wine out there for him every <laughs> Passover. Now, I don't know much, but if he shows up and goes house to house drinking every one, he's going to be drunk. <laughs> a drunk prophet? No. Uh, but that just shows me that they knew their Bible and that they're waiting for him. So we go back to Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, and Jesus says, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was, was for to come. So if you receive it. Well, did they receive it? No. But had they received it, then John the Baptist could have been Elijah right here. And so instead of Elijah, John the Baptist could have filled in and the tribulation could have taken place there. Now let me show you why I say that because it's not me saying that, it's Jesus saying that. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. So this idea that I told you that it could have been either way, it's biblical. It's not just an opinion of Robert Breaker. It could have gone either way. It depended upon whether they accepted or rejected their Messiah. Okay? Luke chapter 1 and verse 11. Luke 1, 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Okay? This is Zechariah. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, or Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he goes in the spirit of Elias. Okay. So somehow God would have accepted John the Baptist as in the spirit of Elias and it would have fulfilled that prophecy if they would have accepted their Messiah back then. But because they didn't, God said, okay, well, I'll literally send Elijah in the future. Does that make sense to you? I see it right there. I hope you do as well. But go to Matthew chapter 17. Also, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 10 through 13. So I find it amazing how God always knows and, and always gives us choices. And we can make the right choice or the wrong choice. Either way, God's still going to bring His will to pass. But if we do the wrong thing, it takes longer. If we do the right thing, it's easier, right? It seems like. So don't do the wrong thing and your life will be a lot easier. That's what it sounds like. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 10 through 13. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? 
And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Now verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist was killed. So John the Baptist could have been Elias in the sense that he was the spirit of Elias. And he could have been counted for the tribulation to take place here. And the millennial kingdom could have been set up there had the entire nation of Israel accepted their Messiah. But what kept that from happening? The religious leaders would not accept Jesus. Had those religious leaders repented and accepted him, probably Rome would have taken Jesus and crucified him. He would have come back after three days. Then probably maybe the first three and a half of Jesus' ministry would have been counted and then the other three and a half over here. Maybe that's how that would have worked. It would only have been three. But then Jesus would have come and then the millennial kingdom would have been almost 2,000 years ago. But that's not how it worked out. But I wanted you to see that because I want you to see what the Bible says. I'm not just up here, as my wife says, speaking out my butt, <laughs> making up theories like some people say online in the comments. Breaker's making up stuff. Oh, it could have been like this. Oh. No, Breaker's reading his Bible. And the Bible says that he would have counted him as this if they would have received him. And because they didn't, now it's like this. Okay? Am I too crude sometimes? Probably. Oh, well, I just, I got to... I'm trying to be like John the Baptist, right? He was pretty crude. I'm starting already with the leather here. Okay, so back to Matthew chapter um, 11. Matthew chapter 11. So I see it as it was this or this. And because they rejected, it became this. And we call this the postponement theory. And it's more than just a theory, it's a fact. And this right here is a parenthesis in the plan of God because the Jews had to go into... Um, well, they had to be dispersed and, 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 and be punished for what they did to the Messiah until God then goes back and dealing with them. And God will go back to dealing with the Jews, won't he? Yeah. I believe he already has. How could they become a nation again in 1948? That's just coincidence. That's God dealing with his people. And I believe he will. That's why I believe we got to get out at the rapture. All right. So back to Matthew chapter 11. And in Matthew chapter 11... Where do we end up here? We, we uh, finished in verse 14. So, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. So if they had accepted it, well, they didn't. But that shows me right there that what I'm teaching you is 100% correct, that they had that option and they just did not take it. Now, the verse uh, that comes after that is verse 15. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> We've heard that a lot in the book of Revelation, haven't we? So if you got ears to hear, hear what I just said, okay? And no more comments or emails saying breakers making stuff up. I'm just teaching the Bible, okay? Amen, brother? Yeah, Amen. Oh, it is funny. It's, it's sad, though, too, that people, they just, a lot of times people show their ignorance, don't they? And it's just sad. So that's why we should reserve what we say sometimes before we study it out. And then, then we can speak. Anyway, I'm not trying to put anyone down. I'm just saying, please, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Now, verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? Okay. This is a generation. We are in what they call Generation Z. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Z is the last letter. I remember when it was Generation X. And was that after us? The generation right after us is Generation X or something like that. But I never heard anybody talking about Generation Y. But now they're saying Generation Z. What happened to Y? I don't know. It's like they skip. But it's like even the world knows. Yeah, we're at the end. We're at the last generation. It's just so, it's amazing. So they're calling the, the generation of today Generation Z. But Jesus says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is likened to children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. Okay? I don't see that, do you? <laughs> Kids out on their own by themselves without their parents. We don't see that nowadays. But when I was a kid, yeah. I remember as a kid, I'd go a mile to the end of the point on my bicycle, a mile back. There used to be an old gas station out there and two old men that would just sit around and smoke all day. And I remember if I had two quarters to rub together in my pocket, I could get a Coke and a candy bar. And I'd ride my bicycle down, talk to those old men. And right, I never saw another car. Hardly anyone ever went out there. Never was worried somebody's going to kidnap me. My parents didn't want. It was a different generation. Nowadays, you can't let your kids leave the house. You'd be scared to death that somebody would, would steal them. You know what I mean? So it's a different generation. But here's Jesus' generation. And apparently, in that day, a bunch of kids can just sit around in the market 
<laughs> and, and nobody cares what those kids are doing. Now I've seen that in places like Honduras and Mexico where a lot of kids are just in the street playing and stuff like that. So I'm seeing it in my mind, it's kind of like that. And saying, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. Now what is that? I guess these kids are all practicing and then somebody comes along and hey, dance for me. And okay, and I guess it's supposed to be all jovial and oh, I, I please the kids or whatever, you know. But I just, I've always read this and I, I don't understand it. I really, honestly, this is a passage that I don't understand. So if anybody has some light on this, leave it in the comments. Is this a Jewish custom? What is this? Whatever it is, he's saying that the generation is like a bunch of children that are kind of like wasting their time, is what it almost sounds like, right? They got nothing to do but sit around and just play. You, know, you play an instrument, you play sports. <laughs> Why don't you work? Why are you playing? You know, it's interesting. So, uh, and, but what is this? We have mourned unto you and you not lamented. I don't understand that part. Anyway, it says in verse 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath the devil. So they didn't like John the Baptist. Who said this? The Pharisees. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a winebibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. <laughs> it's like you can't win for losing. Is that like that today? If you say you're a Christian, then they'll lie about you. They won't find any good in you. They'll find the bad in you. Why? Because the world hates Christianity. Because they say all Christians do is go tell us how evil we are. Well, it's because we care. We tell you, get right with God, because we don't want to see you end up in a place you shouldn't be, right? So I don't think they see that we love them. That's why we tell them do right. All they see is we're a bunch of idiots that, that are misogynist and, and sexist and racist and homophobic. And what are these words they come up with? And all they want to do is call you names. Well, I guess things haven't changed too much in 2,000 years because they're doing that to Jesus and John the Baptist. That's what we see that Jesus is saying. So it says here, then began he, oh, oh, I forgot the end of the verse, okay? The end of the verse says here, but wisdom is justified of her children. What's that remind you of, Laura? It reminds you of Proverbs, where it talks about wisdom a lot. So Jesus says, but wisdom is justified of her children. So if you're wise, then it will come out, all right? If you're evil, that comes out. It will always come out, the truth. And we're starting to see a lot of truth coming out more and more every day. The only problem is a lot of people's blinded to it and don't want to see it. But the truth will come out eventually. Even if it's not in this life, it's only at the judgment. So always do right. Now verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. So here we see Jesus going out. And remember, he'd sent the disciples out to somewhere else. Now he's going by himself and he's talking about these cities. Now, as he mentions these four cities... Did he, well actually I think there might be more than four, one, two, three, four, five, five cities. Is he going to each one and giving a woe in each one of these cities? Or is he just went to one place and then saw them all at one time? And then, I, I don't know, but he mentions these cities. And he says to these cities, woe unto them. So I made a little map up here and we'll see the cities. Here's Sidon and here's Tyre. It's up by the coast. Here's Chorison, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, and they're toward the north of the Sea of Galilee. Now, we've seen Jesus going up here a lot, kind of center of his ministry. But most of these down here were Jews. So from here, kind of like from here up were Samaritans, right? He said, Don't, go not into the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans. So Jesus stayed up here and sent all. Now, there's some people online that say this. They say the word Jew comes from Judah, all right? And they say, Jew is only the tribe of Judah. Well, Judah and what was the other one? Benjamin were the two main tribes down here. All the other tribes of Israel were up here. And so this is a lie that they say on, online. They say the word Jew only applies to Judah. That's not true. Jew applies to all that are what? That are Hebrews. Paul said he's a, of the tribe of what? Benjamin. Okay. Well, that's down here too. He says a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? And Paul was a, a Jew. And what did he say? He said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that means what? Does that mean only to the tribe of Judah can get saved and none of the other ones? No. The word Jew in the Bible applies to anyone that is of origin of one of the 12 tribes. That's what the Bible teaches. And we see Jesus staying up here. Where did he send the 12 disciples? All down in this area. Somewhere over here is Jerusalem. So we see Jesus staying up here and sending them down there. 
Now, why did he do that? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew why Jesus did what he did. All I'm doing is following in the scripture. And I'm going, wow, for some reason, Jesus sent his 12 disciples. They all came down to these cities and he stuck up there with these cities. But those are the what? Those are the Samaritan cities, the ones he said he didn't want to go to. So I don't know. I don't know why we're seeing what we're seeing, but uh, why didn't Jesus personally go down here? Well, do you remember our verse by verse through the book of John? In the book of John, it says uh, several times he didn't go down to Jerusalem because he was hiding himself from them. So it sounds like at the time they were already conspiring. The Pharisees were going to kill him if he comes down here. So Jesus is going wherever he can until the feast. And it seems like he always would go down there during the feast time. Okay, so we see the method to the madness, if you will. Jesus has a plan and he's going to whoever will listen at the time. So he says here in verse 20, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Now verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorison! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for me. So somewhere down here, is Sodom. Some people think Sodom was right around in here, but other maps have it up here. So this is Sodom. And then Gomorrah was down here. You've got Sodom and Gomorrah. So Jesus is talking about these cities. And he said that there have been some miracles in those cities. Now are those the miracles Jesus did in those cities? Or could it be he sent the, the disciples into those cities? I don't know. Maybe they went there too. I don't know. But Jesus is passing a woe on them. And the woe is, why didn't you guys believe it? Woe unto you, because you saw the mighty works and miracles, and you chose not to believe. Sodom didn't get to see anything. So it's going to be, wow, it's going to be more judgment on them. And there's this old saying that the more you know, the more you'll be judged because you went against what you knew, or something like that. I forget how to say it exactly. So these are these cities. Um, Chorizon is a city about two and a half miles north of of. Um, of, of Capernaum. And so these aren't very far from each other. I mean, you can walk to each one of these cities, these three, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorison. And so there are the cities that are mentioned. Now, what happened to Sodom? He mentioned Sodom here. What happened to Sodom? He got burned. Let's look at that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 13. When we think of Sodom, we think of a certain thing that took place in Sodom. What happened? Where was Sodom? Sodom was the place of the Sodomites. Right? There is a word in the English language, Sodomite, that describes what the people in Sodom did. And the people in Sodom had gone so far against God that they were practicing sodomy. That's where it comes from. And let's look at this real quick. I don't want to get too much into this, but I do want you to know what the Bible says about sodomy. Okay? Genesis chapter 13, verse 12 and 13. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 13, 13. 13 is a good number, is it? Interesting. The Bible says that Sodom, or the people of Sodom, were sinners. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, now let's go to uh, Genesis 19. Why were they sinners? What was it that they did that was so sinful in the eyes of God? And, and why... Why did God judge them, if you will? Genesis 19, verse 1 through 13. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now my lords turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they say, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, Sodom was like, to me, New York City, basically. You go around at night in New York City? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, I had a friend that lived in New York City, and he said, you couldn't ride the subway at night. you get mugged. Until this guy Giuliani took over. He said, when Giuliani was the mayor, you could ride it at night. 
And I went and visited him in Brooklyn, and we rode the subway at 2 in the morning. And I was scared, but we were safe. How interesting when you have a certain person in from a certain party, it's better. You put someone in from, I don't know, another party perhaps, and you can't even go out at night. It, I wonder if there's anything to that. Maybe not. Anyway, okay, so let's continue reading here. Uh, Genesis 19. So they wanted to stay in the streets because these are the two angels that came to judge the place. They were probably looking to see the sin, to see why they were judging it. And uh, what verse did we stop there? Genesis, what is it? Three. three. Okay. And um, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now verse three. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now that's not them come out and shaking hands and saying, Hi, my name is. All right. They wanted to rape them. That's what this is telling us. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So according to the Bible, sodomy is, is wicked. Well, you can take that or leave that, but um, I don't want to get into it because whatever it is, it's filthy. I'm just leaving it at that. Okay. Now it says, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So these men wanted to do a sin of rape. And he saw he couldn't stop them, so he was offering his own daughters to them. I don't like Lot very much, but you know what the Bible says about Lot? It says just Lot. For some reason, God overlooked some of the sin of Lot. Uh, but Lot, man, he loved the, the city. He loved the carnal things, it seems like. And he was willing to put up with a lot to live in that big city. And um, I don't know, I, I just, I, I, I don't like a man that would do something like that. But let's continue reading here. Verse 9, And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now, I think what these people are, there's no other word for it, are reprobates. Yeah. Because it wasn't just one or two guys. It was the whole city wanted to, I hate to use crude terms, but gangbang somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they wanted to do horrible things to these two men. And if they didn't get their carnal, fleshly lust fulfilled, they were just going to take Lot. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So the Lord does not like it when people rape people. Okay. Did you know rape is a sin and it's a horrible thing because there's no free will there. And you would think if someone is pro-choice, they would be, they would be all about a someone to have autonomy of their own body and, and things like that. But we live in a society that's pretty evil today. And if the economy crashes tomorrow, within three days, there'll be riots in the streets and people murdering and killing and doing this same thing to each other. We're only about three days away from something this bad happening in, in America and in the world. Uh, civilization is a good thing. It keeps this from happening. But what kind of person would do something like that? I cannot fathom as a Christian wanting to do that to someone. I'm happy being married and having a wife. And it's wonderful when someone wants to do something with you of their own free will. Abusing someone and taking, that's a bully. And I don't like bullies. I don't like bullies. But let's see. Let's read verse 23 to 28. I don't say how anyone could say this is a good thing. Right? But yet in the world today, there are people out there saying, no, we demand our right to do this. <laughs> What are you demanding a right for? Um, let's go to uh, 23. The
The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You know, you can go over there today to where Sodom once stood and you can still find there are big balls of sulfur about that big around. It says in, oh, is it Isaiah or Ezekiel or one of those places? It says Sodom is a perpetual burning. And there was a guy named, uh, what was his name? Ron Wyatt, who went over there. And matter of fact, the guy that went with them came and visited me at my house. Who was that brother? Brother Greg. And Brother Greg, it's his hand in the video that, that, that has it, that's holding that sulfur ball. And I met that guy. And you go there today and you can find where the city of Sodom was and dig just a little bit into the wall and it's all ash and you'll find little sulfur balls. You break them in half and put a lighter on it and it starts burning still. A perpetual burning I think God is trying to show you that there are some things that God said I didn't design man for and I don't want men to do. And so God judged that. And it says, The Lord rained, down, uh, rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew up upon the ground. But His wife looked back and from, from behind Him and she became a pillar of salt. Wow. And Abraham got, got up in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Well, that's a, a hot, hot smoke, isn't it? So let's go back now to Matthew. But I just wanted to, to divert ourselves for just a second to see. Jesus is saying in verse 23, But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. What a thing to say. God will be more lenient on those people than He will on the people that rejected Him while He was here on the earth. Can you figure that out? Because I can't. I would think He would be more uh, against uh, the other thing. Um, but that's what it says. That's what it says. So we don't hate anyone who's a sodomite. We love them. We want to see them get saved. But we do try to warn people. That is not something the Bible says is a healthy thing to do. Okay, And it, it makes you dirty. And it can lead to disease. Okay? And I'll leave it at that. Verse 24, Matthew eleven twenty-four. 24. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now verse 25. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. What an interesting thing to say that God hid from the wise and revealed to the prudent certain things. What, what did He reveal to the prudent? Well, the fact that He is God manifest in the flesh, and that He's here on the earth, and He's the Messiah and the Christ. So, God sent some signs, and some people believed it, and some people didn't. It's almost like, today, there's something up there <laughs> that the world's looking, well, the world's not looking at, but we were Christians, we're looking up at that Virgo, right? And we're looking at Revelation 12 and we're kind of going, is this a sign? <laughs> is this the hand? Are we this close to Jesus coming back? Some people believe it. Some people don't. All I know is that he promised he would come and I can't wait till he does. Now, with all this read so far, let's go to Luke chapter 10. And um, we're going to look at a cross reference that's going to fill in a couple of blanks for us. Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. And in Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, remember what's taking place. Jesus sent out the 12 and he sent them out to go do miracles. Did I say it last week? I think I did that there was more than 12. There was actually 70 all total we found in another passage. Did I say that? If I didn't, I needed to say that because he sent the 12, but he also had some other ones. Because here we see he mentions the 70. So there was more than just 12, there were 70 of them. And it says here in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. <laughs> what a funny thing to say. People always come to Jesus and they say something and they're expecting something. He says something totally off the wall. And they're like, but what? what? Well, we know what he's saying. And by the way, what is, what is Satan Falling from heaven as lightning have to do with anything. Is he saying the name of the Antichrist right there? I don't know, but there was a certain fella in this world. The Bible says when the Antichrist comes, he comes in his own name. This isn't the real name of this fella. The real name of this fella is Barry. 
But there was a guy in this world whose name was Barack Hussein Obama. Barack means lightning, Hussein means the anointed one, and Obama means from high places. <laughs> so, I don't know. Some people think that Obama's the Antichrist. Well, that maybe is Jesus telling us, you know, when this guy shows up and his name is lightning falling from heaven. Maybe, you know, I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's interesting. Verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So no uh, serpent venom or scorpion venom injected inside you can hurt you. Isn't that interesting? Um, that's what it says. I mean, just I'm reading what it says here. But in verse 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good unto thee. So here's where we see Jesus saying that in Matthew. All right. Now let's read uh, two more verses here. All things are delivered to me of my father and no man knoweth who the son is, but the father and who the father is, but the son and he to whom the son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. Okay, so here's the cross reference and we see what's going on. And we see when this literally took place in this event, there was some other things taking place. So that's why it's good to read all four Gospels because then you can go back in that moment in time and say, well, Jesus said this. He was also saying this, this, and this too at the same time. All right, so back to Matthew chapter 11. So that's quite interesting, Matthew chapter 11. So Jesus says, verse 25, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom soever the Lord will reveal him. So this is interesting. Of course, we know the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, one God in three. These three are one. We call that the Godhead. And we see Jesus praying. And then it's like he's answering John the Baptist. Art thou he or should we look for another? John the Baptist is basically saying, who are you? Well, it's like he's saying, hey, I'm the Son. And the Father knows I'm the Son. And the Father wants to reveal that. Well, the Son wants to reveal who the Father is, and look at me because I am on the earth. Okay. Now we come to the end here, verse 28, 29, and 30. And here's a great passage that literally applies to over here and here, but we can totally spiritually apply to us today. And it says here in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Perfect message for Labor Day. Amen. <laughs> Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Labor is work. Heavy laden is having a lot on you. Boy, it's not fun to have a lot on you. Ever try to carry something heavy? What do they do in the military? 60 pound bag they make you carry. Is that right, Brother Ray? 60 pounds on your back as you go marching and stuff like that? That's right. Man, that's, that's heavy laden, man. I don't want to carry 60 pounds. That's rough on your knees. But it says, I will give you rest. Man. Isn't that what you want? Who here is, is uh, tired all the time? <laughs> I know you are. I know you are. My hand's raised too. So we get rest in Christ. Isn't that what we want? We want rest. Thank God for Saturday and Sunday. Well, at least we have some time to rest and sleep in maybe once a week. Or maybe for me, after church, maybe get to take a nap. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So rest is a great thing. But this is he's talking about physical rest. But he's also talking about spiritual rest. So he's telling the Jews, you can rest in me if you trust me and go through the tribulation. And then you get to rest with me in the millennium. But we can apply that to us. Rest for what? For our souls. And it literally says that a little later down. Find rest for your souls. So let's read verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. So to the Jews and to us. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now there's, there's an Old Testament reference for this. Let's go to Jeremiah 6.16. Jeremiah chapter 6. 
a lot of the times when Jesus is speaking, he's quoting scripture that was the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. That sounds like a works gospel, doesn't it? The Old Testament, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. But Jesus is saying, you shall find rest for your souls. That's the Old Testament. So this sounds like Jesus is quoting that back there. And then he's applying it to them. When would a Jew find rest for his soul? Well, if he's in Christ, then he dies in the millennium, then, then he's going to you know, go, go to heaven, I guess, at the end of the millennium when he dies. But uh, for us that are saved, we find rest in our souls when we get saved through Christ. And salvation is eternal life, and you're supposed to have assurance. When you're saved, you know you're saved. We call it no-so salvation. So are you saved? Do you know you're saved? Do you know 100% beyond any shadow of a doubt that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? I do because I'm resting in the finished work of Christ to take me to heaven. I'm not trusting in what I do to get to heaven because then I'd always doubt it. I'm trusting in what he did that's taking me to heaven and I know that I'm saved. So Jesus talks about taking his yoke upon you. What is a yoke? A yoke is something you put on an animal to use that animal to pull you along, like an old chariot or something. In Honduras, they had oxen. In America, we don't have oxen anymore. They've all died away. But oxen are great for carrying things. They had an ox here, an ox here, and the yoke joined them both together. And I've seen people in carts with oxen pulling them. And I thought, wow. And that ox, he's there and he's pulling that cart, but he's so strong, it didn't look like it's a lot of effort for him. <laughs> I mean, it might be, but they've got lots of muscle. But you know what? There were two of them. Do you know it's easier to go with two than it is with one? So when we go with the Lord, boy, it's, it's great that He's there with us because when we get tired, He helps us along. But it says, uh, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. I could go way into that and talk more about that, but I just want you to know that where do we find our rest? In the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I'm resting in the blood. I'm resting in the atonement. I'm resting in what He did here to take me to heaven. I'm not looking at myself thinking, well, oh, am I good enough? And fingers crossed I might make it. I'm not trusting in what I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be resting, would I? You're sitting in that chair right now. You must trust that chair if you're sitting in that chair. Are you running around bragging about how you're sitting yourself up? <laughs> or would you say, no, I'm trusting in the chair to sit to rest. I'm resting in the chair. So you're resting in Jesus. And then he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that is true, isn't it? Does God ask too much of us? No. Uh, we should probably do more for him. So I think we should close with uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And this is, these are great verses because we know that salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. But after you're saved, what should we do? Should we get saved and then go live on a beach somewhere and and drink mint juleps and eat bonbons and just do nothing and just rest the rest of our life and do nothing for anybody but ourselves? <laughs> no, we're taking his yoke upon us because we're receiving him as our savior. Now we're wanting to go do something for him. We're rearing to go. We're ready to work for him or we should be. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not work that saves us. When we're saved, we're saved by faith alone, and we're resting in Christ. But look at the next verse. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God wants you to do some works. It's not what saves you. It's not what keeps you saved. It's what you can do after you're saved so you get some rewards in heaven. And whatever you do for Jesus you'll get rewarded. So I think you should do more for him. And the more you do for him, the more rewards you'll get. It's kind of like, well, should I tell on her? It's kind of like Nikki. <laughs> I asked Nikki, what are you doing for Labor Day weekend? She said, I'm going to work. I said, why? She says, I get overtime. 
She knows, hey, I'll get paid a little more if I go to work on this day <laughs> than the other days. So I'm going to, I'm anxious. I want to go do something to get that more reward. I think we should all have the same mindset as Nikki. <laughs> hey, I get some rewards in heaven for serving the Lord. I want to do more for the Lord because I want to get more rewards. And that's what we should do because he says his yoke is easy and his burden light. Amen. So that is... Uh, Matthew chapter 11. Anybody have any questions or comments on that? I want to say... Yes, sir. Uh, so, the, he already had it set up to have the spiritual blood here there. And he also had it set up to have the, the man of sin and the son of perdition there also mm -hmm. for the same time period. And uh, I wonder if he already had Moses lined, lined up. Sure he did. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll go to Matthew chapter 17. We're going to get there eventually, but look at Matthew chapter 17. Um, you're right, man. That just made me think of a lot of things right there. Matthew chapter 17, though. Matthew 17, 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So Moses and Elijah were up here in heaven waiting and they're down in heaven going, okay, is it going to be like this or is it going to be like this? And so they knew and they show up and Jesus is like, well, wait a little bit longer. We'll see what they do. So yeah, yeah, Moses and Elijah could have literally showed up too. But uh, it could have been that, that John was counted as, as, as Elias. We saw that in the scripture. And it could have been like that. So where would Moses have showed up? I don't know. That, that somebody in the spirit of Moses was already lined up for that. Yeah, yeah. But also... He already had Judas as the man of sin and the son of perdition. Right. So Judas was the man of sin and could have been the son of perdition. Rather than hanging himself, he could have somehow been the, the Antichrist. But that made me think about Satan. Satan's probably sitting there watching all this going, Okay, do I get into him here or do I get into him here? Do I get to take over my kingdom here or back here? And so I bet the devil was kind of like angry. Oh man, I got to wait 2,000 more years, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, that's, that's a good, yeah, that's a good thought. But uh, quite amazing how the Bible tells us that John would have been counted as Elijah. But where would Moses have been in that? That's a good question. Maybe the law is Moses, I guess, counted law and the prophets. I don't know. A lot of unknowns, but I try to stick with what we do know. Amen. Anybody else? Nobody? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, last week I had said about how, you know, Gentiles are always a part of it. And obviously God knowing everything knew it. But then too, just like you showed this week, um, I feel like that's also a picture of how he, his, his patience, like he gives us all that free will, just like he gave the Jews the chance. And, and that's a picture of how we still, even up until the very last moment, have that opportunity to be saved and to accept the finished work of Christ on the cross. Amen. That's called free will. And unless you're a Calvinist, you believe that. <laughs> and we know that God gives us the option to choose. And we can choose Him or we cannot choose Him. But it's our choice. If there was no free will, then no one would ever go to hell. Because they could literally tell God, well, I was just a robot and I didn't choose anything, so you can't put me in hell because it wasn't my fault. <laughs> no, because we have free will, God's going to say, you're going to hell because you didn't choose me. And it is your fault. And so thank God for free will. But that, that, that ties in very well, yes, with free will. And so, yes, God gave the Jews a choice and they chose poorly. God's given us a choice. And it's, to then it was a nation to choose. To now it's you as an individual. Now, who do you choose? And you need to choose Jesus Christ. And that's why he pleads with you, come unto me. And uh, the question is, will you come to Jesus? And what's interesting is the last book of the Bible, the second to last verse, what's it say? Even so, come Lord Jesus. So you come to him and then he'll come for you. <laughs> Amen. What a blessing that'll be. Amen. So we're looking for the rapture. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you again for coming and uh, we won't be here next week. So pray for our meeting over there and then we'll, uh, we'll be back the week after that if the rapture hasn't come yet. Amen. Mm -hmm.